there's a lot of people that don't want to have this conversation that you know they're scared they might lose their job or they might not get the endorsements they not might not be treated the same way and those are things I'm prepared to handle and those are things that you know other people might not be ready for uh, it's just a matter of where you're at in your life what where, where your mind's at and at this point I can't look in the mirror and see other people dying on the street that should have the same opportunities that I've had and say you know what I can live with myself because I can't if I just watch. I'm Garrett McQueen. I'm Scott Blankenship. And this is Triloquy, the only classical music podcast telling you to shut the fuck up and listen what other classical music podcasts scott what, what other podcasts don't you know there aren't any <laughs> but only because that's the title of one of the compositions for today you see i i want to know who has the <laughs> i want to know who has the bingo for the soonest the swears dropped in an opus because i think it just happened <laughs> in the first 30 seconds there are there are people who they're like consultants and marketers and like high level like producers who say you're not supposed to curse in the first five minutes or so <laughs> but I'm not editing myself for the sake of a piece of art, for for the sake of a composition. I think that's fair, right? Sure. Shout out to Joey, the guest, the very special guest for uh, this 87th opus of Triloquy. Um, they and I are going to have a very, very, very good compo- uh, composition conversation. You got a chance to take a listen uh, earlier, actually, uh, mm-hmm. to, to the conversation. What did you think? Um, they and I are suffering from some of the same mental issues. You see? Yeah. So, you know, it's affirming just that, you know, everybody's going through it to one degree or another right now, man. Absolutely. Huge shout out to Joey. Looking forward to sharing that with y'all. Um, as I said, Opus 87 here. Thank you to the returning listeners. Thank you to the new listeners. This podcast is growing every single week, and I am so grateful to each and every one of you to give us the opportunity to join you, whether it's in one sitting, whether it takes you three or four sittings to get through these Opuses. It's really our pleasure to bring this to you every week, so thank you very much. This Opus of Triloquy is made possible in part by Modest Brewing. Last week, I had the opportunity to lead a conversation called Breathing Conversations, which also served as the drop of a new beer. It's this incredible beer over at Modest Brewing. If you get the can, you get to read this incredible statement uh, by Ramsey, uh, co-director of the Brewing Change Collaborative, a uh, group here in the Twin Cities, focusing on brewing and race and and, and those kinds conversations. Scott, you'd be surprised or maybe you wouldn't be surprised how similar the conversations are concerning equity in brewing and equity in the arts, equity in so-called classical music. It's incredible. I have to think that brewing is just another area where people don't think about it happening and yet it's just as likely to happen there as anywhere else. Yeah, I'll read a little bit of what's on the can. It says, to have an honest conversation around race, we must begin with a reckoning of one's position in the uh, machinations of race. Race is a construct born from white supremacy. White supremacy is embedded in our everyday lives. It's just a matter of whether you benefit from it or are harmed by it. Black, indigenous, people of color, folks have been harmed by it for generations. And um, I'll, I'll post the rest of that uh, on the website for you to read. Scott, that's one way to begin a conversation over a, a tall a tall boy of beer, isn't it? Reading that and more. On I don't can. think they would have gotten all that on a 12-ounce can. <laughs> it had to be, a tall, had to be a tall boy. <laughs> so huge shout out uh, to uh, Modest Brewing. Um, the downbeat for this opus, of course, came from Colin Kaepernick. Scott, some Sometimes I wonder to myself, have we forgotten all of the money, all of the attention that's still paid to the NFL Mm -hmm. and he's out here and is still not working, maybe willfully at this point. I don't really think it matters. I think uh, it's important to name that, especially when we're talking about Black History Month. Agreed. Agreed. Um, I don't know. This is something that we talked about recently when... Uh, These articles were coming out about uh, diversity initiatives among arts organizations and everything, Mm -hmm. how it's 
uh, we, we were both hoping that it wasn't just a trend, right. you know, that it wasn't something that was going to be something that just faded away. Yeah. For like five or six weeks. And then all of a sudden, you know, you're right back into your old. And we see how it's yeah. faded away in the NFL. So, you know, we're, I just wanted to make sure Colin Kaepernick got a space on Triloquy got for some Black props. History Month. Uh, but there will be a little bit of Super Bowl talk, both in the first movement and in the Triloquy, mm. because I have some words. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, uh, But more than just words, music, you had uh, some Coltrane you wanted to share today, right? That's coming up? Right. We're going to talk about... I, wanna, I wanted to bring in a love supreme and talk about how the four movements in that work are sort of lining up with a lot of the diversity initiatives that right. some... Uh, organizations are rolling out. And also just to touch on very uh, briefly, Rasan Roland Kirk. Yep. Uh, I have uh, some other broadcast things going on as always. I want to uh, shout out and thank everyone who has broadcast the sound of 13. I think I'm in 10 cities at this point. So shout out to all of y'all. Special yeah. shout out to KVNO for being the springboard for that. I also have a Sirius XM feature this week. So, um, and also uh, later on in the triloquy, we have to talk about a black man in jail, whether he should be out given bail it's complicated but we'll get there but for now movement one. Oh, say can you see scott who done it best so a big part of the super bowl every year is that song that they call the so-called national anthem mm -hmm. star spangled banner a big part of the event every year um is what celebrity gets to sing it uh we all have our favorites we all have our unfavorites but i think it goes without a doubt that whitney left a uh, very particular mark huh in a track suit <laughs> well that was the thing that back in those days, she was fresh. I'm looking at a picture right now. We all wanted that white track suit. We just called it a jumpsuit. Oh, is that right? Okay. Oh, no, a jumpsuit is a one a windbreaker. We will say that, okay. windbreaker. But no, it just seemed like, you know, this was just like the third or fourth thing on her to-do list for the day. You know, she probably had to go, you know, she was going to go to pick up a couple things at the, at the shopping center on her way home. And... <laughs> she had things to do later. Right. I'm, I'm reading. So a lot of people have been talking about it, not only because we talk about it every Super Bowl, but this year marks the 30-year anniversary of Whitney singing that song. I'm reading here from National Public Radio. It says, the lasting power of Whitney Houston's national anthem, a little bit from it. Why does Whitney Houston's 1991 Super Bowl national anthem still resonate 30 years later? Um, and it talks about the, uh, you know, the feature and, and everything you can listen to. I'll link it there in the, uh, in the article, uh, in the uh, description of this. But um, Scott, I, I guess I want to sort of unpack that first question. Why does Whitney Houston's 1991 Super Bowl national anthem still resonate? One thing that I think of when I uh, think about why my mom loves it and some of my uncles is the orchestration, mm. the, the the drama of the timpani sure. and, and all that. What, 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 what is it for you? Why do you think this one has lasted so long? Probably a universal appeal. You what know, do you that mean? There's, well, I mean, that there was just elements of, of it that I think everybody could appreciate. We were talking earlier about Fergie's performance, how, you know, you appreciated it. I, you know, for me, it, you know, it wasn't, I, I wasn't up in arms over it, but it didn't, it, it didn't sure. inspire any, any positive uh, thoughts in my mind. Sure, sure. I don't know, maybe Renee Fleming? When when she did it, you know. The, yeah, and so and to me, there was nothing and no shade. You know, all respect to Renee Fleming, but it was very correct. It was very, you know, standard. But sure. there's something about Whitney's version, right? Wait, the, the, people don't talk about Renee Fleming's like they do Whitney's. Mm. So there's something about it. There's some sauce there. Yeah, some, just a, some je ne sais quoi. A, a universal appeal. She was also her career was really hot at the time. You know. I also remember sometimes uh, people say that there was uh, a one of those calls for national uni ba unity back in those days. Maybe it was Desert Storm or something. In yep. 1991, I was four years old, so mm -hmm. I don't know. But well, was was that an aspect of it? A hundred percent. There was there was. Uh, a couple months where there were active duty troops over there, boots on the ground, you know. Um, I live near an air base, so I knew very much that we were in the middle of uh, military action just because of the tense nature that was uh, just in the air on the base. Yeah. So I guess hearing that song from such a world-renowned superstar and 
incredible vocalist. I think we have to name both of those things, superstar and someone who could really sing. Sure. That that must have brought something. At, know, a time, at a time when uncertainty was just around every corner. Sure. And I guess applauding and screaming for Whitney Houston made some of the white people feel like they weren't racist, huh? I don't know. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> You know, you know, sure. you know it's true. You know it's true. Okay, fine. I, maybe somebody did it. I don't know anybody. But either. shout out to all of the allies and accomplices who love Whitney as well. We need y'all. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna have the Star Spangled Banner on this podcast. That's not happening. But what other Whitney performance um, is it? What? 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 So Black History Month, we're here. Mm-hmm. What Whitney Houston song belongs in the Whitney Houston? article of the encyclopedia which one which one do we need to go listen to i whenever i was djing a wedding reception or high school party uh i want to dance with somebody was always the track that got the floor packed all right well here we go course it's not just the music of the super bowl that people talk about the commercials Mm -hmm. people love the super bowl commercials i remember uh when i was younger it it felt like more of a thing really you know seeing what budweiser would do this year yeah they backed out though i mean there were some good commercials but i have well first and foremost and we'll get into this in the triloquy i was not sitting there watching the super bowl but at one point, I happened to turn on uh, the Super Bowl thinking of the commercials. Oh, I guess maybe Super Bowl commercials are still a thing. Turn on the TV, uh, and it's an all uh, was it uh, all state? Uh, yeah, it was an all state commercial. See, I don't even remember. Yeah. It was an all state commercial, yeah. and it had the you know the the normal uh, guy on there. I, I let's let's shout him out. Let's look him up. Okay, his name is Kevin Mims. Scott, you are an actor. How much, who you have killed for the role of Jake from State Farm? That's <laughs> I, a bag. I don't know. That's if a I bag. Would, I don't know if money. I would have killed for State Farm, but I don't know. He has a million um, dollars at this point. Probably. Yeah. And any, you know, just from the residuals, you know, this is, this guy's going to have a check coming in every month for a while based on just the number of, of times that this, this commercial is going to be played. Anyway, so I turned on the TV. I saw Kevin Mims, Jake from State Farm, mm-hmm. and the 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 shtick is like, oh, we have stand-ins, and Kevin Mims, Jake from State Farm, is like, oh, my, look at my stand-in, and it's Drake. Mm-hmm. Now, this is significant <laughs> because what people need to understand is that Beyonce is not going to put on that red polo for y'all. So let's go ahead and mark off the number one superstar in the world. Let's go to number two, Drake. They had to have paid him seven figures to sit there and do that little 15-second spot. You think seven? It couldn't have been. Drake? I mean, not $500,000, most certainly not. Uh, there's Here, there's even a song where uh, Drake talks about that not being enough money. I'm upset. Half a million on my head I can't accept, yeah. At least it made me feel like someone tried their best, yeah. Want to waste a half a million, be my guest. So there is no way that it was a measly amount of money. Yes, State Farm got my attention by actually getting Drake on a commercial. Mm -hmm. How much money did they not give to the NAACP in whatever city, to Black Lives Matter, to Black Creator, to another actor actor like Kevin Mims, whose life would have been changed by the opportunity to be on a Super Bowl commercial. We're talking about being in the middle of, um, you know, Panera. and (laughs) Right out here in the middle of Pasadena. And there are a lot of artists, including actors, and I'm sure, again, you can speak to that in your experience, who would have loved that role, that opportunity. Drake ain't the only light-skinned black person out here for y'all. Okay, so who would you put in after Drake, then? If Drake Drake wasn't available, or there wasn't a figure that would get him to put a red shirt on... (laughs) Who next? I mean, there are a lot of actors out here looking for work. You're, I mean, you're asking me to shout out an actor. I don't know any actors. 
I, you know, I don't know anybody on the anybody ground, famous, you know? anybody famous. Oh, but that's my point. Why somebody? I, I get why they got Drake. Why it's cool to get someone famous. But I think looking back at the bigger picture, there are so many folks who could have used those resources, and you used them all up on Drake. True. Well, it's, and I love Drake. It's an so. expensive joke, is what it is. It's right. you know just to say Jake and Drake being so rhymy. Yeah, you sent me um, I, and. Like I said, was trying to kind of get into earlier. There aren't as many. It doesn't seem like there are as many commercials that people just guffaw over like there used to be. But you sent me an interesting one featuring Michael B. Jordan and Alexa, right? Uh huh. One of those home assistant pod things where um, they this woman gets the idea that all of this information would be so much better if it was coming out of Michael B. Jordan. What I thought was really great about it was the husband getting upset. Yeah, yeah. And... No, don't don't put the bath oils on the shopping list. Don't do that. But what did you think of the scene where the woman is in in this commercial? The woman is in the tub and Alexa is reading a book to her. Mm-hmm. I guess it is. And Michael B. Jordan is in the tub, but still with his clothes on and stuff. <laughs> but well, it's interesting because commercials like that have historical context. Last week, Dell and I watched. Uh, a uh, a documentary on TPT. I'll, I'll link it in the description to this uh, Twin Cities Public Television about Josephine Baker. And of course, there's the piece of music uh, by Valerie Coleman. Shout out to her that she wrote uh, in honor of Josephine Baker. Uh, for folks who don't know, the um, the black, um, I don't know if you would call her an actor, but performer, just a mm-hmm. black performer who really found success over in France. And every time she would come back, over here to the United States will be reminded that they only see an er, you know, they, oh. they, they, they only see a, a black gal who, who is this woman gallivanting. And, so she lived a better life over in France. Um, side note, Josephine Baker, I don't know if you know, this guy was the only woman to speak at the March on Washington from which we got the famous, I have a dream speech. No, I didn't. Uh, know. She was actually, Josephine Baker was banned from the United States because of uh, the work that she was doing over there in world war two and anti Nazis, but also civil rights. Mm. And we know how the FBI and those people treat the civil rights workers. Mm. They got M- Malcolm X killed Martin. Let me not go down that path. But anyway, they banned her from the United States. Martin Luther King jr. Found a way for her to get here. She was the only woman to speak at the, um, the March on Washington. So anyway, just, a bit of history there Mm. i bring that documentary up because one of the points they made in it was that sexualization of the black body across the board was sort of taboo so of course for black women but even for black men we talk about harry belafonte and all of these star black actors from back in the day Mm -hmm. they were never openly allowed to be the sex symbol because that's just a little bit too naughty the idea of a white woman having fantasies about a black man or any woman having fantasies about a black man openly for that regard so when you when you bring when you brought sent me that uh commercial featuring Michael B. Jordan for it to be on the Super Bowl and a man like Michael B. Jordan to sort of be this prototypical sex symbol for women. There's historical context. And I think it's important to name that, especially during Black History Month, but, you know, for what it is as well. I don't know. I thought it was great. It was. Yeah, it was a great commercial. No, I'm not saying that it wasn't a great commercial. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm saying that there's context to that sort of thing. Yeah. No, it's a good reminder because I, you know, as I sat and watched it, I just thought about how clever it was, you know, all those contextual things that you brought up and never even crossed my mind. So again, back to Drake, my favorite male a uh, rapper, I almost said actor. <laughs> well, I guess he's an actor. Well, he started as an actor. You Did know? he? Uh, uh, Degrassi. Uh, Degrassi, the next generation. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, was in the wheel, had him in the wheelchair and everything. Ah. Uh. And now now he's selling in- insurance. Uh, D- D- Dale said, no, no. What, what, what did he sing? He said, uh, now they're not as switch insurance, you. <laughs> we'll, we'll put the song on top of that. But um, I wanted to uh, share some orchestral Drake. And the problem is that the orchestras that have done it haven't done it great. Uh, the Nashville Symphony paired Tchaikovsky with Drake lyrics. I listened to a bit of that. Thought it was thought it was pretty lame, but I did find one uh, quartet arrangement of mm-hmm. Drake's tune, God's Plan. So we'll transition um, into our next accidental with a little bit of that.
bad things. It's a lot of bad things that they wishing and wishing and wishing and wishing and wishing on me. There's my singing. You sang last week. I sang this week. Okay. I wonder what I'm going to bring next week. <laughs> Gemini strings there um, mm. playing, playing God's plan. That's a good song because as I just sang in those lyrics there, Drake is in that video talking about, uh, in that song, talking about all of the people who just wished bad on him over the years. And here he is able to give to people. And that you've seen, I've shown you that music video where he's yeah. just handing money out. Yeah. Look at, look at what yeah, can happen. Wouldn't that be wonderful to be able to do To meet that? Drake, I know. I mean, the handout. <laughs> oh, no, can yeah. you imagine the look on people's to faces? To change people's and, lives. Yeah. yeah, because a lot of these rappers... Uh, and artists across the board, $10,000 ain't nothing. Right. Handing $10,000 to a mother of four who lost her job during COVID right now, that is a, a life changer. Handing me $10,000 is a life changer. You know, and so. Yeah. Shout out, shout out to Drake. He has some problematic history we aren't going to go into today, but shout out to Drake for um, selling some of y'all State Farm. I'm I'm probably not changing my uh, car insurance because I don't I don't hardly drive my car. So why am I going to be paying high insurance? You know, I got both my home and my car and my motorcycle. Look at you with State joy. Farm. Yeah. yeah. Oh, oh, you're with State Farm. Yeah, because they um, they give you a discount when you bundle. Oh well, I don't have a home to. To, to bundle in, but oh, oh, actually, my renter's insurance is with my car insurance. I'm not going to shout out the insurance company because they haven't paid me. So, mm. but anyway, uh, <laughs> and speaking of being paid and ownership, that's t- that takes us to the next accidental. Um, I gave. I don't know if I, I gave an accidental in the last thing. Whitney and all those people, a sharp, mm-hmm. obviously. I'm going to give this a sharp as well because this is great. I'm reading here from Complex.com. It says, Joe Budden announces multifaceted deal with Patreon. So for anyone listening to Triloquy at this point who does not know who Joe Budden is, I think I um, can name him as a role model of mine is listening to Joe Button's podcast that inspired Triloquy. I listen every week to, um, you know, keep my ear on what's happening in hip hop and in hip hop news. So very important content uh, creator out here. Anyway, uh, from this article, um, Joe Button is quoted as saying, I've seen firsthand that exploitation is everywhere in the industry. It's become the status quo, and I'm tired of it. He goes on to say, I'm tired of constantly fighting for independence, and I'm tired of proving my value over and over again. This partnership with Patreon marks a new era for the creative economy, one where independence comes first and creators get paid, something that shouldn't be revolutionary. Creators should get the biggest stake in their art, and the system isn't ready to do that. So we're going to change the system. This is the new blueprint, and we are the first. So basically, long story short, the Joe Button podcast was really, really successful on um, Spotify. They had an exclusive deal with Spotify. Joe actually said it. He actually published this not too long ago. He said that Spotify offered him and his team $20 million dollars. Mm. For continued exclusivity, that twenty million dollars would also mean that the intellectual property, the what they create, you know, for the podcast, mm-hmm. belongs to Spotify. Right. Joe said, "No, fuck off," and I'm going to Patreon, where the people can pay for the content, and they will pay me directly. So, my question for you, Scott, would you have said no to twenty million dollars? If so, if Spotify said, "All right, Garrett and Scott, Triloquy, we'll do it, and we'll, we'll get let's not even say twenty million dollars, let's say two million dollars, mm-hmm. and the intellectual property is ours," could you say yes to that, or, or would you say no? The intellectual property is ours. Is theirs? It oh, belongs to Spotify. Okay, because there, there you first you said it's ours. Yeah, um, I was speaking from their perspective. Man, uh, not having the clout. And the history that Joe Budden has. Mm-hmm. And also just that two million dollars is more money than I've I've ever thought about in my life, you know. So of course I would probably go, sure. And that's something that Joe talks about a lot. He says that he has to do what he is doing For to the... show an example. Sure. Because sure. 
20 million dollars you know is life-changing for him as well despite the fact that he has the clout and all of that and he is still willing to say no right because he believes in the power of creators valuing their art and, let's, and i think that's admirable let's be honest not everybody can be beyonce and drake right. not everybody can be rolling in money right so there's far more people that are going to benefit from what he's doing here than will suffer from it but i'm sitting here thinking yeah i still would probably take two million or am i splitting it with you obvious i mean i'm getting most of it (laughs) that's what i'm saying here so um and you know you and i you and i also have we we've got this different approach to it um i'm i'm just not married to owning the content as much as you are I'm just not. I don't know why. I'm going to read a little bit more of this article here. Um, Joe is quoted as saying, uh, well, first of all, in the article, it announces that in addition to being a part of Patreon, he's been named head of creator equity. So I'm reading a Joe Button quote here. It says, head of creator equity at Patreon. Do you know all the steps that had to happen for this to happen? Don't listen to this and say, oh, I know where Joe's coming from. No, the fuck you don't. You weren't there one year of that Spotify deal when they offered a blank $15 million in a growing market and blanks had to say no. You know how much self-serving shit I walked away from? So I think a part of, you know, the again, the bigger part of his point is that this isn't just about him. This is about giving content creators the courage to really say, no, that's not enough. No, you aren't valuing my art. And I think that's that's very, very admirable and something for us all to be paying attention to, you know, taking this away from the podcast world and going into music. You spend a lot of music at your job. How much money are those artists getting for your spinning that recording and not and let's oh, not even don't... say the composer every single orchestral musician right, every right. single producer behind those tracks you know what what kind of money are they getting for you airing your you know whatever on the radio yeah radio's got a stretch um i i know that much of that money goes into marketing distribution promotion but so to the artist the though, artist huh? the artist is getting a, a sliver of that money. So what is it going to mean when composers like Joey, who we're going to hear from in a bit, um, other living composers, other musicians say, actually, I'm going to make sure that all of our content goes into places where we can benefit. You know, we were talking about Bandcamp a little bit last mm-hmm. week. Mm-hmm. Do you not think that this can be the seed? We're going to talk about a piece of music a little later that's called Seeds. Do you not think this can be the seed for that sort of huge shift? Artists saying, no radio station, no TV network, no whatever. Don't use my con uh, content anymore. I'm put- putting it over here so that I can actually benefit from it. And so the folks who want it from me can get it from me directly. I think that is something that we can at least imagine happening down the road we have to at least consider as i was talking to as we were talking to evan shout out to evan um he he was hanging out a little bit earlier we watch youtube way more than we watch cable tv or i would imagine even some of these streaming things we pay for every month we certainly watch more you know even so more netflix and hulu and whatever than we do cable television truth so when is all of the content or most of the content that we consume on a daily basis going to be this independently uh, owned and conceived stuff like podcasts, like YouTube, mm-hmm. 15 minuteers, 20 minuteers. I think there's something there to talk about, something to consider for the future. Maybe if more people band up with Joe Budden yeah. and start doing this themselves, they create more, they normalize it, right? Yeah. So... And maybe that's what it'll take is get more people to do it. And what they're doing right now is keeping, you know, their twice a week podcast on, you know, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts and all that stuff, but releasing uncut sort of, you know, extra, you know, after dark Mm -hmm. and putting that on the Patreon and you can get that for, you know, several different tiers. So I was thinking, Scott, what sort of content could we put on the the Triloquy after dark, the Triloquy (laughs) Patreon? Oh, I'd really be cussing then, huh? (laughs) Maybe full interviews. 
I'm thinking, see, I'm trying to think of something spicy. Like maybe I'll read down the contract that we all, that, that the two of us signed to, to, to get ownership of this show. Mm. That, that, that's some content. Sure. <laughs> but I'm not doing it here. Um, if I, if I decide to do a Patreon or something, I'll let y'all know. Um, but y'all are, y'all are supporting this in an incredible way. So, um, I, I, I have to name that. So thank you very much. Shout out to Joe Button for, um, advocating for the content creators 10 years ago even five years ago if someone told you that they were a content creator you'd be like what's that but sure. these days content creators are making millions of dollars so it's an industry that we have to acknowledge as as a legitimate one agreed yeah. yeah um i uh thought i would transition here uh you know there's a lot of content out there and when we talk about orchestral music there are still uh, you know, certain barriers when it comes to radio stations uh, and the infrastructure not paying artists right. But folks are coming up with orchestras that can record the music and maybe something else is being worked out on the ground level. So um, in conjunction with, you know, all the syndication I have out there right now, there's a tune by composer Erilyn Wallen. I don't know if you know who she is. Scott, a, a, a black composer born in Belize, lives in England nice. these days. Uh, she wrote this tune called Mighty River in honor of the centenary of the Abel of the slave trade in England. And I thought this would be a good connector here because the performing ensemble is called Orchestra X. And when you have these um, more independent ensembles, you have the opportunity to talk about equity in recording, who gets the rights to X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, th I think we're going to um, see, see more of that. So here's uh, Orchestra X performing an excerpt of Mighty River by composer Erilyn Wallen. All right, Scott, one more quick accidental before we uh, get into the second movement uh, and into uh, some, some of the music we were listening to. I wanted to uh, bring in something that crossed my eyes. It says, I'm reading from the New York Times. It says, Museum Exploring Music's Black Innovators Arrives in Nashville. A little bit from the article. If you want to trace the roots of American popular music, you have to start when Europeans brought enslaved Africans across the Middle Passage. After emancipation, the sounds of Africa and field hollers and work hymns from the American South dispersed across the country and transformed into new forms, the blues in Mississippi, jazz in New Orleans, and later house music in Chicago and hip-hop in the Bronx. It goes in, uh, more into the history of all of this and talks about how this new museum in Nashville speaks to that two things two things scott remember when we had titus on last summer shout out to titus underwood he talked about the building of this museum and what was coming coming along his mm -hmm. point was we already have a museum that highlights the significance of black folks in american music is called the rock and roll museum mm. what's your re mm. what's, what's your reaction to that <laughs> it sounds like titus <laughs> yeah i mean but is it does it sound true to you does it does it sound fair to say? I'm gonna be honest with you, and I did not know that there was such a thing, the Rock and Roll Museum. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, I know about the Hall of Fame, right? In Cle it's Cleveland, right? Somewhere, it's in Ohio. I think it's Cleveland, but no, I didn't. I didn't. It does. It makes sense that it was in. I would have said Memphis first, though. Yeah, well, Memphis is home of the blues, which which they they do speak of. But the other thing that I thought of uh, when I came across this article, I think, and I, again, I think we talked about this on Triloquy one time. You were listening to one of your shows, and they went through all of these tunes from your day that you loved, and the uh, host shockingly says, "All of this is black music." And of course, I got there in two seconds because I understand that all American music is black music. So again, thinking back to that. What do you think about the building of this museum, you know, in the context of so much music and its black roots not being acknowledged? But here we if are. You, we have a new museum that's telling us, you know, what these other museums should be affirming already. If you want me to make an analogy based on that 
podcast you were talking about the 1619 project yeah, that right. New York Times put out. That was a great, that was one of my favorite episodes of that where they were talking about uh, how blackness is in all of the, mm-hmm. all of the yacht rock that I hold so close sure. to my heart. Now you have to remember though, that the way they were setting the table for that was for a white person. Right. Okay. okay. And so, That's a good point. and you have to, and, and this is what I think. I think you should realize that that white person was sitting there in their car going, oh, yeah, this track. Oh, I love this. Oh, I know this one, too. By the time he comes out and says all of this is rooted in blackness, he just set the hook. Okay, so they didn't know that that was coming. Right. And now they're invested. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is this was set up like theater. And that's why it was so important. Now, are you trying to make me say that this new museum is essentially just for white people? <laughs> oh, I didn't think about that, but hey, maybe maybe that's the thing there. What museum really centers the black uh, experience for for yeah, yeah for black people? I don't know so. that that that's an incredible point. I think that point is made clear again when we bring up the fact that all of this music is black anyway. Y'all have these museums and don't affirm the black foundation of it, but here we are. Now we have a museum for the white people to understand that. So, <laughs> oh, good. Phenomenal. Okay. I, I don't... That's That idea isn't <laughs> no, I, fleshed no, out think, yet. No, but that, I think I think you make a very good point. I, I, I think that's interesting. Um, so, white, black, whatever you are, put on your mask, and if you're in Nashville, go learn about black music, I suppose. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, when we were sitting around dinner and, and, and talking about this article, I asked some of the early you know, uh, rock and rollers that came uh, to mind. You mentioned blues already here and you actually brought up uh, B.B. King. What is it about B.B. King that um, sticks in your mind? What makes B.B. King an important black history figure, in your opinion? His signature sound, um, the way that he punctuates the things that he would sing with Lucille. Mm-hmm. And yep. um, there, there's a story about him going into a burning building to save Lucille. Oh, I right? heard him tell one time. Yeah, and I have a I I got really close to one of those stories. My former roommate Patty was invited up to his. Lucille is the guitar, by the way. For folks right. who don't know, we're talking. Lucille right. is what he named the guitar. Come right. on. And she was invited up to the hotel room, and she was one of the last to be lingering around. Wait a minute, she was invited to BB King's hotel room. Yeah, oh, go he was on. playing I'm at a, he was playing at a casino. <laughs> okay, and uh, he she was invited to stay the night, mm-hmm. and she declined. I don't know why. That's not my business. But the way she tells the story, I was just howling with laughter. You know this woman? It was my former roommate Patty, and she didn't want to spend the night with BB King. I'm, I don't know why. Oh, oh, that's, <laughs> hey, this is Triloquy. Wow. Wow. I wish I had the rest of the story. I'd tell it. <laughs> yeah, I'll but have I to ask her. But I don't, but we have some music by B.B. King. Do you have a B.B. King uh, fave? The Thrill is Gone. You know, that's, I, I know that it's probably his most popular track, but it, it's got staying power. And it's been covered by hundreds if not thousands of different artists from all around the world so uh, that's impact a classic composition if you will yeah a little bit of that as we get into the second movement Scott, every three, four, five months, we get the email concerning our treatment of country music. (laughs) Surprised? Uh, The last time we talked about it, it must have been last summer. It was during the Paul Robeson opus, I think, if I'm remembering correctly, a little bit country a little bit canceled mm. that was the title the title of that one opus 57 if you're um interested in going back to that one like i said then uh sure i need to do a better job of looking at and listening to the country music but as soon as i hear that slide guitar i feel like i'm hearing er and i just go the other way is it the slide guitar in like the classic <laughs> stuff like like muddy waters and that or the new country that 
you know, you, you see at the suburb bars. There's, there's just a general aesthetic across generations of guitar-heavy really? music in that style. Hmm. It's probably played by a white person, and it's probably enjoyed by white people who don't want me in that space. So that's sort of my aversion. But as we know about American music, there's blackness in it, you know, even at the foundation. I want to shout out uh, Glorimar. I hope I'm uh, pronouncing your name correctly. Um, they sent me that email uh, <laughs> that comes through and suggested to me an artist named Rissy Palmer. Now, had you heard of Rissy Palmer? No. Um, I was. It was suggested to me that I check out uh, three uh, of her tracks. And the one that I chose to share today is called Seeds. I was talking about seeds earlier when we talk about planting the seed for, for something bigger. And as I played the song for you, Scott, we listened to it. You said it sounded more like blues to you. Well, just that track. Yeah. 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 So and, and again, you know, as we talked about in that last uh, opus where we were trying to dig between between roots and country and all sure. of these these things that all sound similar to me. What is it that you think brings that aesthetic to mind? My guess was just the instrument of her. She has a beautiful voice. The instrument of her voice really speaks to that bluesy sound. Mm -hmm. um, Evan was with us too, though, and he said some of the inflections is uh, was, was really what made it country for him, I mean, do you think it's a vocal thing or yeah, more a, of a, a instrumental style? Or there's what? a there's a vocal thing that happens that I guess the only thing that the only word that I can think of to describe it is there's a twang, mm -hmm. there's a a a twist, to a little twirl, a little sprinkle, a little season. The yeah. way they say certain words, you yeah. Know, yeah, you know, get down, turn around, go to town. Yeah, it, it's it's really great music, and I'm actually hoping to uh, collaborate with uh, Reese here on uh, Triloquy uh, next month. But in the meantime, I just wanted to put y'all onto that. So uh, thank you again, Glory Mod, for uh, once again reminding me and reminding us that Black folks have a role in the classic style of country music as well. So. Um, including Rissy Palmer. Here's a little bit of a tune of hers called Seeds. Brothers and sisters, they may break your bones. They can bury your body, but only release your soul. They may build you a prison, never a cage your mind. Insist you nothing, never believe that lie. You're too free, you're too proud, shine too bright. I want to take you all the way back to, say, uh, the mid-90s, 95, 96, when me, Eric O'Brien, Matt Wayne, Thomas Powell, and a few other people would get together and play cards and listen to KVNO but, uh, on Friday and Saturday nights. Shout out to the late Bill Watts, who was the host of Primetime Jazz. This was a guy who uh, brought his arcane knowledge of jazz to the microphone. Mm -hmm. He saw a lot of these bands play when he was a merchant marine on the East Coast, you know, and um, to hear him spin these tales about the Ink Spots, about Lionel Hampton, uh, the, the list goes on and on. We would call in and he would always play our requests, except for one. He would never play My Favorite Things by John Coltrane. He would get on and say, boys, that song is 13 minutes long. <laughs> So he'd say that over the air to shut us down. But um, he really fostered my love of John Coltrane. And today and yesterday, I was listening to A Love Supreme, mm -hmm. his album with uh, Elvin Jones, Amazing Drums, uh, McCoy Tyner playing piano, and Jimmy Garrison is the bass player. And this is broken up in four movements, four songs. And as you look at the titles for all of them, I was noticing uh, a synergy with a lot of the diversity and inclusion uh, work that is being done by some organizations. And, and in the last few, we've shouted out, uh, like the Public Media for All, mm -hmm. is that the correct name? Mm -hmm. uh, talking about um, actually laying out their plans in a way that looks like it'll be successful. So let's look at A Love Supreme. The first movement, acknowledgement, acknowledge your sins. Second movement is resolution, resolve, 
to address them. Third, probably my favorite movement and probably the most important is pursuance. Pursue that path. And I should also say that's the longest movement, Mm. which I think is uh, indicative of the fact that it's the most work that many of us have to do. Mm. And then finally, psalm, giving thanks. Um, You know, John Coltrane has a church a young uh, a couple heard them heard him play on their first wedding anniversary, and they started the Saint Coltrane Church in San Francisco. The full name is the Saint John Will I Am Coltrane African Orthodox Church. Amen. So yeah, uh, and they had their 50 year anniversary last September. So uh, shout out to the uh, Saint uh, Saint John Coltrane Church, and here's a little bit of uh, pursuance, the third movement from Love Supreme. Now, you know, a lot of jazz artists won't touch that. They, they, that's sacred music. They won't cover it. They won't even quote it. You know, it's just, that's all, John. That's you. We're not going to disrespect it by oh, trying so to play I it. so I thought you meant, when you said that earlier, I thought you meant folks won't put it on the air. Oh, won't, no. Won't share. You're saying jazz artists will not try to borrow some of those solos or, or, they won't or come play up the, with their own performance of it. Is what right. You're saying, they won't play right? the suite. Yeah. Mm, mm. yeah. I think there's something to that. If if they revere it, hey, I do too. This is a piece of music that I had heard before, um, but I wasn't so familiar. How, how did you get onto it originally? I know you talk about wanting it on the radio. How did you know about it in the first place? My first radio gig was announcing jazz music overnight on the weekend. Oh, no, yeah. but I'm so you're saying when you were hanging out with your friends playing cards, this was after you had had this jazz job. Mm. Um, I had had it for. I don't okay, know, so a couple I, years. I'm sorry, I, th- I guess I imagine you being a kid and calling I was a, into the radio. And... I was a kid in my early 20s, yes. Okay, see, okay, yeah. see you have to, you know. <laughs> no, very much a kid. Yeah, and that job, Bill Watts, playing cards with Eric and the guys, that's where my, my love for John Coltrane started. And every time I hear it, I can immediately identify John's style. And the way he played, he was always... Um, his, his solos lasted so long. And there's this great interview uh, that they did with Miles Davis where they asked him about, you know, how come, <laughs> what was up with John and his extended solos? And Miles said, you know, he asked him about it. And John said, I don't, I, I don't know how to end it. I just get into it and it feels so good. And I, I don't want it to end. I don't know how to end it. And Miles said, well, take the horn out your mouth. <laughs> and, um, you know, Uh, Speaking of taking the horn out your mouth, you know, Joey was talking about uh, Sun Ra being Mm -hmm. an influence or an artist they like to listen to. And Sun Ra led me to Rasan Roland Kirk, who was a musician who would play two and three saxophones at the same time. And not just as shtick or a gimmick or something like that. He was playing and making music. It was musical the way that he played. a little bit from uh, The Inflated Tear, the live in Prague, 1967. Just a a golden era for jazz. You know, I love that era. So obviously, all of this counts as classical to me, certainly in the context of black music, black Mm -hmm. history, and, and all that sort of thing. Not everyone agrees. Pursuance. You talk about that being your favorite movement of that John Coltrane. What would be the way you pursue the affirmation of that music as classical in the type of work you do. And let's take Minnesota Public Radio out of it. You're at a classical, a so-called classical station, and you believe that this music should be included. What, in what way do, will you pursue 
convincing that program director or whatever that this is classical music mm. that folks need to know and it needs to be on their radar. I've always, you know, I was the jazz music director at KVNO for three or four years. And I was always uh, bigging up jazz as America's indigenous right. musical form. Right. So in that context alone, it wins in without with with no problem that it's classical music because it is an American heritage. Yeah, it is an American voice, um, and the fact that so many of the founding artists in it were black is, um, yeah, it is America as as affirmed by so many Dvorak from Bohemia mm-hmm. and and everybody else, and you know in that black music. There are so many different aesthetics and experiences and uh, and and sounds as 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 you're about to hear. So as we've been saying, uh, the guest for this opus of Triloquy is Clifton Joey Goodry the Third. We all call them Joey. Um, they're a composer, a bassoonist who's stepping outside of the box. All you know, I, I talk about music being left field mm-hmm. a lot. Some people would consider this music outside of the whole stadium. But you know what? It's classical, and I love it. Uh, A couple opuses back, uh, I think we talked about Joey's piece, Voices of the Ancestors. I think that kind of came in in the triloquy. Uh, We're definitely going to revisit that at the end of of the conversation. But the piece that I wanted to put you on to, excuse me, the piece I wanted to put you on to um, is called Shut the Fuck Up and Listen. First Mm. of all, Scott, tell me that you wouldn't put a little sauce on that if you happen to see that on a playlist and you're at work. You would surely, if that made it to the playlist, oh, you're going to put some sauce on that title, aren't you? Oh, the break, you probably make it your opening billboard for the hour just so you can say it a few as more times. As many times <laughs> as I could. Sure. And what's, what's interesting about that is that goes against the point of the piece, right? Sure. In that moment, we aren't actually listening. We're taking the opportunity to form our own experience and opinions around what they have written. So I think the depth of new music is so great because we get to explore conversations like that, even through edgy titles that we wouldn't have traditionally seen. Mm. Joey and I talk about so many things. Joey is one of my faves, so I'm just going to let you hear it. And to transition for us, a bit of their piece, title. Shut the fuck up and listen. that you know people ask like how did it come about you know and things like that and everything from that album was actually just improvised um and i was really stressed and i was doing a live stream concert with international contemporary ensemble that day and i just laid down these three tracks and i was like oh fuck like this was really good mm-hmm. this gonna be the last track of my album <laughs> um and when it just like putting it next to other pieces and everything There still is a form, and I don't like putting my music in, like, Western context in that Mm -hmm. way, but there still is a form. There is a melody. Um, There's melodies from other parts of my album that come back through this one. There is a climax, and then there is a come down. You know, all of these things, and it's the way new music can be taught in similar ways. Like, you don't have to have this whole separate class of new music analysis. Like, it's you can look at it in sonata form if you choose to do that way. Or just in basic terms of just... Well, it's music. What do you like when you listen to Beyonce? What do you feel? Okay, like this is not pop music, but like, what do you feel? Yeah. Um, and that's why I love like when discussing music. I love talking to my family because like being Creole and everything, Didico is very just all my grandma listens to. Um, but it's a form every time. It's the same shit every time, and people love it, and I love it. But when I sent um my EP to my family and everything, I was just like oh, what do you guys think? And they're like, sounds like soundtrack music. And I was like, awesome, thanks. Yeah. Like, I love to hear that. So I think people try to contextualize new music in this way of othering it all the time mm-hmm. because I feel like a lot of, especially white new music musicians, I mean, contemporary artists love to other themselves and they go to this field of art to get away um, from the other field because it makes them feel more seen and heard. 
and try to separate themselves from the racism and xenophobia and everything that classical music holds but they take that here just with they bring drums. it with them <laughs> yeah like it, there's not a ton different there um so it just uh, it, it's just really frustrating but I do I have really liked that my pieces have made its way into classrooms at different universities mm-hmm. um, to be talked about and brought in the way of how I really mostly use graphic score um, or improvisation and things like that so it has been really e- really easy it has not imposter syndrome has been kicking my ass <laughs> but um, it's been really fun seeing like my work blowing up throughout corona and just seeing how other people have been seeing it in a positive Way. Yeah. And of course, the title itself of that piece of music, you know, shut the fuck up and listen. I think that is a perfect mantra for Black History Month, don't you think? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that title comes from like the story of my album is uh, mental health. Mm. And my mental health from 2017, where I was at Peabody to now 2020, and I was finishing at Manus. Um, and just how life was very different between those two institutions, but just what was going on in my life. And I just found out I had bipolar disorder in 2017, and that really just took over my entire life through medication changes. Um, just thinking about suicide so much, and um, not really seeing any hope, and like not knowing how to communicate that with my family. Because you know, I mean, mental health education is not so common in Black families. Mm-hmm. So if you say like, "Yeah, I'm feeling suicidal," they're like, "Pray that shit away," you know. And it's like, okay, <laughs> going right now, I'm gonna do that. Um, so it just was really frustrating hard if you tell your therapist at school you feel this way they take you to the hospital um and that happened one day and it was a horrific experience i was like i'm never telling anyone i feel this way again um so throughout the years of trying and trying to like figure out how to make this better it's kind of like crash dieting you like try all these short-term things um and then finally i was like you have to listen to yourself like move to new york you didn't get into juilliard and it like really hurt but man it's gonna be awesome it's like the new music conservatory like go do things for yourself. Stop trying to live through the lens of other bassoonists or just other musicians and their standards. Like, you know, you've always loved contemporary art and the new school stands for so many values that I believe in. Mm-hmm. So um, going there and just like being kind of to myself my first year and I knew I had a lot of trauma from Peabody and I knew I was like a raging bitch um, just because <laughs> that's what that school made me feel like I had to become. Mm-hmm. And people at Manus were very kind people for the most part. And I just remember going off in rehearsal one day and I was like, okay, (laughs) Um, (laughs) we need to do some self-evaluation. And just staying to myself really and like shopping and like falling in love with Balenciaga and all of these things. And I was like, okay, that's a different coping mechanism. Like we have to stop that. Like, so just like finally, like cranes in the sky, you know, like stop drinking, stop trying to fuck it away. Stop trying to buy it away, Mm -hmm. smoke it away. And all these things. And then finally, when Corona hit, um, I eh, I started therapy because I had a huge episode, as I'm sure most people did, when the world was changing. Sure. And um, I found a therapist who was just like, okay, let's do these like different tests. Um, and we got to the PTSD test and there's like 60 possible points. And I got 57. And I was like, oh, shit. All right. Um, and she was just like, you need to listen to yourself more. Like your body is under so much stress, which is what's causing this association episode, um, which that happens to me sometimes in my life. This was the third really big one that I've had to travel home for. Mm. Um, so it's really rough. And that's why I was like, you need to do things for yourself. You need to start this medication. Fuck other people who say, like, the medication makes them feel like a zombie. That's valid for them, but stop using their reason to make you feel like you can't do it. And almost a year later, I feel like a new nigga. So (laughs) it's amazing. And, like, it's with listening to myself, Garrett, like, that recital I did when I was artist in residence at Virginia Tech, I worked my ass off for that residency. And I did the recital, and I got everything done in one take. And I was like... Oh my God, this is the Peabody education. This is the education from Mark Goldberg and Rebecca Heller when they kicked my ass. And I always felt like I was fucking surviving and I was never playing. And I played, mm-hmm. you know? So when I was listening to that, and I just remember calling Rebecca and crying and being like, this is who I, like, this is my true ability and I can finally tap into it. And part of me was sad of just like, wow, I wasted so many years. And I was like, girl, you're 25. Like, <laughs> <laughs> there's so many more years to go. So. I'm so happy that I did shut up and listen to myself because it really wasn't talking about the world. 
but it that can apply to that but it's really like we need to listen to our bodies we need to listen to our inner child a lot of us especially black people especially black queer and trans people have immense amount of trauma oh yes especially those of us from the south so you know it was it was super cathartic making this ep and just like the first track is very dark you know <laughs> i've like dropped my voice and distorted it and everything and just going through the album and ending with my family um also shutting up taught me like you can't judge people for what they don't really know people should still respect you people should still respect your boundaries and people should want to learn especially those closer to you but there was a period where i hated my family mm. like all of them like a true hate and i was like where is this coming from i'm gonna have to stay away i haven't been home for christmas in a couple years and now i really love them yeah. so much <laughs> like i had to really just say fuck these niggas start from scratch um i know we have the same blood but i never want to see you guys again mm. um Except for my grandma. That's my nigga. So, and I would call her throughout this and I was like, my mom pissing me off. My stepdad makes me just want to run as to the moon. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and all of these things and my cousins. Um, and I made the last track, The Souls That Sit With Me, and it's my family. Every voice you hear is my family and they're so fucking Creole. They're so country. I mean, it's just the whole thing of like, in Houston, Lake Houston is deuce in part. But my cousin Tony is like Dusson Park. And it's okay. like, it's not French. Everything is not French. <laughs> like, <laughs> so it's been like, a, I wouldn't say rough couple of years, but it was. But it's just been really nice seeing this project come from such a dark place and now making it. And people try to say like, you're using your trauma for money. It's like, no, bitch, mm. I'm using my healing for right. money. Go try it. Right. You know, just because my music, a lot of it does sound very aggressive and all of that. But aggression doesn't have to mean negative right they always try to say that we're aggressive when we're passionate but they also use passionate as a microaggression <laughs> we just have a lot to say and, and a lot to deal so, with too yes with with your bringing up mental health and even suicidal thoughts it's so important to affirm those things because other people maybe most people go through those things you know when i was going through my own mental health challenges and my own suicidal thoughts breaking it down on this show you know the the feedback i got from folks just so grateful what i learned you talk you talk about listening to yourself what i learned was that there were triggers in my life that i needed to just get rid of for me um the main one was respectability um and i got rid of that and here we are smiling but you know yes. but some <laughs> but some triggers you know aren't so easy to get rid of i wonder if you've had a challenge um pushing certain triggers uh to the side existing as you are in the music space in which you exist yes you know because you're from the south too memphis right? tennessee 901 yeah. shout out <laughs> okay, being from Houston, land of Lizzo and Beyonce and Meg Thee Stallion. So I can't it just, tell y'all nothing these days, huh? Okay, look, no, we produce everybody. So, and Solange, you know, I can't forget her. But it just, we're, Southerners are people pleasers, you know, mm -hmm. and we move out of the way for people. We give everyone our shirt. We're taught like, okay, everyone's not, like, there's good white people, there's good cops and everything. And I've had to let go of that. I also had to let go of my fear of abandonment. Yeah. I had to let go of thinking like, well, I need to keep this person in my life because they like show me love, but they also like really treat me like shit. But the love is so powerful. We're supposed to love each other. Jesus would want us to do that. You know, and all of these things, um, learning that I, it's okay if I don't reply to you in two days. It's not that I hate you. I don't want to talk to anybody right now. Yeah. And I also don't have to tell you that. So other people's anxiety and trauma is not my trauma and anxiety. And it doesn't mean you can be a bitch to these people. But just learning, taking space for myself, communicating with um, my, well, former teacher, Rebecca, now just my mentor, during my lessons, if shit would get kind of hot, I would be like, look, we can't talk to each other like that. <laughs> like, yes. I can't, you can't defend these white people in front of me. And it was also just such a learning process of each other learning how to break down these barriers between student and teacher. And you don't have to take your teacher shit. And she never gave me shit. She's like the most loving person in my life. And she also just showed me that like, stand up for yourself like if you're in a lesson and it's just like you don't necessarily like the way someone is talking to you it doesn't mean that they're necessarily a bad person but they're harming you at the moment right and people think harm is just on this super extreme scale and it doesn't have to be if it makes me sad i don't want to deal with it um so just like not being afraid to people please and every time i talked to her about it she always took a second and was like thank you for telling me and the lesson got better yeah you know and that's how 
I don't know. I know a lot of people who do not talk to their teachers after they graduate. And that's like my nigga. Like, I love her. You know, so <laughs> we talk all the time. And it's just so great with my friends of just like being really open with them about my mania and depressive episodes. Um, that was a huge fear because I lost friends in undergrad because I didn't have control of my disorder. And like, it did affect my friends. And now of learning those boundaries of like, okay, do I tell, do I talk about this or not? And now being older and most of my friends actually being in their thirties and I'm 25, it's a nice situation where they kind of have this like older sibling kind of vibe or older cousin. Um, and I can be super on, open and honest with them with the same with like potential partners or just close friends that may be a little younger than me. It's I've not been afraid to hide a very big part of myself. Um, and I would say the biggest trigger is going home mm -hmm. because I'm a very quiet person at home and you know, I am not quiet in any way. <laughs> so I just went home for my mom's birthday and I felt myself becoming quiet again because I don't actually enjoy being there all the time. And I had to walk outside and be like, you are a bad bitch, stop this. <laughs> we pay for therapy, yes. like put it into practice. And I went back inside, I took a shot and I was like, what's up y'all, you know? Um, I didn't hide anything. People were like, why are you going to San Antonio after this? And I was like, I'm going to go see this guy. Um, and people were just like, you're gay. And I was like, are you fucking stupid? <laughs> yeah, like, <laughs> I am wearing a dress in my profile picture. That doesn't mean someone's gay, but like, come on, one plus one equals two. <laughs> so it was, it was, it's been really nice. Like having a therapist who is just such a strong woman, um, who's an immigrant from Haiti and has told me her story of how she had to really find that immigrant um, to fight all of those immigrant um, terrible stereotypes, especially as a black woman, mm -hmm. and now having her own mental health practice. So uh, she's just been so inspiring and in making sure that I withhold my boundaries. And if people disrespect my boundaries, then like they're not the person for you. Yeah, so, and, and God help them. <laughs> okay, look, try Jesus, not me. You know, right. it's just that it's the phrase of 2021. I want to rewind back to the uh, what you were saying about the teacher-student relationship. I know you, I'm sure you know Lacolian. Shout out to Lacolian Washington, yes. my first teacher. We had rough days when, you know, we were in the student-teacher sort of vibe because I felt like he was oppressing me and that he didn't understand that. But, you know, since graduating and since continuing that relationship, you know, it's really shown me the power behind that sort of relationship. And I'm lucky enough for mm -hmm. my first teacher to be a black, a black man. So, you know, it, mm -hmm. it's really phenomenal. I wonder what your lessons have to be like or had to have been like considering the music that you create. It's one thing for me to talk with you yes. about me and Lacolian uh, going over the Mozart or going over the Weber. Surely that's not happening in your lessons, the, the traditional it rep. It is. Wow. Yes. Rebecca, look, you're going to play everything. Because <laughs> uh, a lot of people, like I'm sure you know, but a lot of other bassoonists peg her as this like contemporary bassoonist and that's it and she won new world she won civic mm -hmm. she won jacksonville principal bassoon and when she left they asked her to come back and play contra you know so we did a lot of excerpts and because like getting into spoleto i still had to play excerpts along with it, like a contemporary solo um and she her whole motto is like whatever you do just be the fucking best and sometimes when it gets spicy you just know that it's coming out of the most love <laughs> uh, but she's gonna kick your ass so the lessons really look like um the biggest thing, I had a lot of solo shows in the fall um, of 2019. Yeah, fall of 2019. So we worked a lot on that. And then um, I was deciding if I was going to reapply for Julia for my master's. Mm -hmm. um, and she was like, eh, why are you doing that? And I was like, oh, I just want to go there. Um, but she convinced me not to. So then in the spring, um, I had my contemporary master's auditions at MSM and NEC, which we should actually talk about the NEC audition. Um <laughs> And Manis for their new composer performer, and she just made me do um, present myself well, making sure all of the contemporary solos were just like a one that there's a difference between a microtone um, and just like a zero doubt note. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I was getting ready for a concerto competition on Mozart, and she was like, Mem "Everything's for memory. Um, just play it well. What is your interpretation? Like everything just has to be." You have to convince yourself that it's going to be good because if you can't convince yourself, no one's going to believe mm -hmm. you. Um, but she kicked my ass in like every direction and it was really tough. But yeah, <laughs> we really covered everything and she worked me so hard on the contemporary stuff. 
going back to Chike 4, going back to Ro Ravel Piano Concerto after just like having to bust out a high E or G at any moment in these pieces Easy. is just Nothing. insane. And that's why <laughs> contemporary music needs to be in pedagogy. Yeah. So, or just like her telling me that like when you're improvising, just do the C sharp to E all the time. If you're doing like an A major or even A minor, anything improvisation, do the C sharp to E. Just do it. And now it's not a problem. Right. That will manifest in other works. And, and exactly. Another, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. That's so, incredible. I want to hear. Yeah, the lessons. I want to oh, hear. I want to hear your Weber Andante and Hungarian Rondo. I, I bet oh, you slay that, that one. <laughs> <laughs> so funny story. Uh, <laughs> my first year at Peabody, we had a master class with. Um, who is that NEC associate of Boston? Ooh, Richard, no. Is that Richard Svoboda? No, he's the principal. Okay. Ranty, something Ranty. Oh, I cannot think of his you know, name. I don't, we had a you know, him. I don't know the girls. Yeah, it just, <laughs> <laughs> we had a master class with him and um, I played that piece and I've been working on it so hard, but you know, the ending is a little crazy. Um, and I did not double tongue at that point in my life. and. I just told Mr. Coker, like, I don't want to play the end of this. And he was like, it's fine. And I told the pianist, like, let's stop here. And he was like, no, like, just push yourself. Let's do it. And I was like, we've never rehearsed this. And you took this tempo just like to the moon. And I ate shit so hard. <laughs> and the teacher just like really railed me. And I was really sad. And I never played that piece again. So. <laughs> Well, you can talk about double and triple tongue. And if you want, the last page of that piece of music, as far as I'm concerned, has a, a one slur. <laughs> from from Look, the beginning up to the end. Let's do it. <laughs> I'm here for it. You've, it's, men it's, you've mentioned Juilliard a couple times, and I want to I want to unpack this a little bit from the outside yes. looking in. It seems like there's a bit of Juilliard validation you were looking for. Why was yes. Juilliard the school that you just needed to get into? It was just always a dream. You know, they send out those like pamphlets and stuff um, to your house when you're little. I guess if they know you're a musician. I was like, oh, this is really cool. And I looked into it more and I watched, I think that show, that movie is Center Stage um, about ABT Academy and stuff, mm -hmm. but just all of these things. And um, it just seemed like the place to be. Like if you were going to be that bitch, you go to Juilliard. So I was like, okay, I want to do that. Um, and my mom just raised me to like do the best thing possible. And that's just what it seemed like. I love the faculty there. Um, the recordings I heard, and I was like, okay. And I just remember also like looking up when I found out about Lacoli and Monica, and they both had gone there, and I was like, okay, so I really need to go here. <laughs> um, and it just seemed, I mean, it really just seemed like the place to be, and I fell in love with the idea of the school. So what would you say to that Joey today? Oh, just go practice. <laughs> like, it's okay. Like, <laughs> it's, no, there's other things out there. Um and that school may not be the best place for contemporary bassoonists yeah. specifically. Um, I love all of the faculty. Well, I don't really know Judy, um, but between like Kim and Frank, they're so accepting. And at Manus, Kim was there and she loved the music I played. Frank told me he loved that I found the path that I have on the music and that I do well. So I knew the support would be there, but I don't know if the curriculum would have fit me necessarily. Mm -hmm. So I would just tell myself like, find the best school for you, but find the best school that can support you financially and have the best faculty and best opportunities. But, um, and it just happened to be new school. And that's why I'm back now for this diploma and um, composition. Cause it just, when I was looking for what to do right now, cause like many people my age or older, there's no jobs mm -hmm. and I run out of health insurance in a year. So with bipolar disorder, you can't do that. Right. Like I need medication. So I looked at my options and I was like, okay, I can probably get back to medicine for composition. Uh, and I did. So I'm back there. And it's a school, like I said, I believe in. I'm very anti-institution. But those bitches have a good thing going, I will say. Um, and they just provide health insurance. They provide help uh, in everything. So just tell myself, like, don't be so into this one name. Because there's many names. Yeah. But also, like, fuck status. So it's, it, I would tell myself a lot. Also, to go to therapy. That would be the most important yeah. one. You know, we're in Black History Month. And uh, you're, you're talking about composition and William Grant Still, Florence Price, Margaret Bonds, these folks are important, important black composers for us to be looking at to year round, much less Black History Month, of course, you know, we've all had that conversation. But fewer of us 
understand the black names in new music that we should be paying attention to year round and in Black History Month. Uh, from your perspective, who are some of the names or what are some of the stories in new music that we need to infuse into black mm -hmm. history? Definitely Sun Ra um, and how his music is what a lot of white people call it out there or just like <laughs> otherworldly and all of these terms. Which is just they, Sun Ra's music. Exactly. And they tried to peg him as this like weird bitch, but John Cage was allowed to just pick mushrooms and be happy, you know, so. We are literally um, celebrating three minutes and whatever of silence over. Exactly. <laughs> I call it white meteorocracy, but you know, um, definitely Sun Ra, definitely um, Julius Eastman, his story, mm -hmm. like, whoo, it hurts so bad, again, going to Manus, because he died very close to where that school is. Oh, wow. Um, so just reading about him, never been taught about him. And I learned about him going to um, Banff because we did Gay Gorilla. I was like, who is yeah, this? Yeah. And I said that in front of George Lewis. And he was like, what? And he was like, you consider yourself a new music girl? <laughs> okay. And he was like, and black? So right? <laughs> um, we were in a seminar and I raised my hand and I was like, I've never heard of these people. And he was just like, well, yeah, the institution failed you, but you're also failing yourself. Hmm. Like if the institution is not going to educate you, pick up the work and I was like you're right so um definitely Julius Eastman with his story of like just being treated terribly and of course I said fuck status but also he went to Curtis um and we all know how big of a school it is and how hard it is to get into and people just disregarded that but when Ray Chang goes to Curtis it's like the best thing possible so um that was that was tough to swallow and just find out he had a mood disorder which led to other problems in his life and homelessness and death so um, those two as ancestors and as living, I mean, George Lewis, a lot of people don't know about him and that blows my mm -hmm. mind. Like he is the black new music grandpa. Like everyone loves Uncle George. Um, Anthony Braxton led, I mean, I just don't, I just don't understand how more black people don't know him. Like he is that nigga and he's alive. He's turning 75, I believe this year. Um, but they've been celebrating his 75th for the past couple of years and just his graphic notation, like what you see in my wall, that's one of his mm -hmm. scores hung up because he is such a big inspiration to me. Um, Tyshawn Sori. Oh, yeah. Um, yes. Cousin. I love him. I just love, you know, he has a huge name. But when I met him at Banff, he treats me like a little cousin. And I just love that I can go and text him and be like, what do I do to get my rhythm better? And he just sends me these books where I'm like, can we have a conversation about this? And he's like, yes. He makes time for people. Um, and Lisa E. Harris is from Houston, amazing composer, amazing soprano artist. Um, she is one of my biggest just mentors that I'm in contact with on a regular basis. And I would say um, Martina Roberts is someone everyone needs to know. Everyone else I just named knows I absolutely love them, but they also know that Montana is the reason I am the artist I am today. Mm -hmm. Like, she is the reason I'm a composer. She is just the reason I use graphics for her. Um, I met her at Banff in 2018. She's a saxophonist, visual artist, mixed media. And I saw her scores and I was like, I used to do this in high school. I used to draw and assign sounds to things. And she does it in such a beautiful way and just where her music stems from, her coin coin um, mm -hmm. chapter on like all of her pieces. And everyone needs to know her. Everyone needs to know her. Actually, I think they go by they them. But everyone needs to know them. And it is just, there's so many black artists out there. So that's something I do for um, my pieces as a composer, since a lot of my pieces are based off of conduction, um, which is from Butch Morris, and that Tyshawn Sori does so amazing in his piece, Auto mm -hmm. Um, But I send people when they're like, I've never done this before. I'm like, listen to this Spotify playlist that I have and just dive deep into it. And when people come back and it still sounds a little like, mm, like, what are you doing? I'm like, did you listen? And they're like, no. And I'm like, do not play my piece then. Like, don't do that. Like, you need to learn about this. Right. It's important. You can't just apply things to this. And it's okay if it's your first time improvising because it's scary. But go listen to the people that do it. And someone who is on that um, that playlist is Marion Brown, a saxophonist composer who is also an ancestor. So inspirational. His music is amazing. His melodies are amazing. And it's just... It's heartbreaking that I was never taught these composers. And I went to Peabody, you know, like Hopkins, they pride themselves on being this top institution. You're not on top. 
if your education isn't well-rounded, like truly well-rounded, and it's not like, of course, we center blackness. And I know we're going to do that. It's also just though, like there is so much beautiful contemporary art in Mexico City, in mm-hmm. all of Mexico. Like we're not learning about anything, right. nothing. Right. Right. You know, none of the brown and black girls are happy. It's the fact that like, I love that you did a um, land acknowledgement. Why is this school that pro- provide, um, holds itself to these five pillars of diversity and inclusion, why aren't we taught to do land acknowledgements? Right, right. You know, so it's just everything. Like, it, it's so frustrating. But those are the composers that just are so important. And I'm not going to bring in some other people. I'm bringing my younger girls and like Jesse Cox. Um, we're working on this Pacific concerto right now and it is killing me. But <laughs> he is amazing. Amazing. I love playing his music. Elizabeth Baker is just an amazing sound oh, artist yeah. in Florida. The Honorable. The Honorable. <clears throat> that nigga. Like, she is, will let everybody know what is up. Like, I just love her so much. Um, Nick Dunstan, who is from New York, but now lives in um, Berlin. Um, and, and Hannah Kendall is at Columbia. Yep. Um, she is just so well established in London and now also the States. Um, Marcus Norris, you know, like there's so, 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 so many people that our names are also not being brought to the light. And this, like, I definitely talked to you about this, but I feel that in a lot of our communities, like gateways and everything, we need to be giving George Walker, um, Margaret Bond, Florence Price, everyone their flowers. But there's also people still alive right. today that also deserve their flowers. And both can exist at the same time. If we're truly programming all black people, it should be from across all time. Exactly, lines. because we aren't a monolith. We we are very colorful within ourselves. And for all of the names that you listed, there are so many black folks listening right now, white folks as well, who have no idea who these people are. And that's just going to take... You know, I hate to say things are going to take time, but it's going to take a little bit of time for those names to be more common, to to be as uh, well known as your Philip Glasses and John Cages mm-hmm. and all these things. What do you think is your responsibility, our responsibility as black musicians to realize that, to see that happen? It's one thing for us to, you know, every time we have a recital, schedule this music. Those of us in broadcast media give space to it. What else can we do? Because there's such well, we have so much catching up to do. Mm-hmm. I would say the one of the things I love most about being a contemporary musician is that I don't have a boss. I have no one Period. to check into, and I can program whatever I want. Period. <laughs> so um, to never assume like what our audience would want, especially audiences that look like us. And the best way I learned that is at New School with this Black History Celebration. And the whole theme of New School really is contemporary across like all realms. So it was people from Parsons School of Design, people from Lang with poetry, and um, some people from Madness and Jazz doing music. And I have this film, um, 2.19 AM, which is based off of um, a manic episode. And it's pretty graphic and everything. And the crowd was all black. And I was a little nervous because I was like, oh, I've never done this in front of black people before. And the amount of people that came up to me after was like, I have this disorder. My son has this disorder. My niece has this disorder and people don't understand and now she's in prison, you know? Um, and just saying like, we are just so smart. And I've always knew, n- known that, but um, I've never seen it in real time because all the spaces I've had to play in have been so white. Yeah. So, and just understanding that black people love everything and black people can relate to everything and we make everything. That's how we can relate to everything. So um, just truly just not giving a fuck and inviting our people into these spaces, but also not looking to just program all these black programs, and invite black people into the Met, go to our neighborhood, find a space. There's always open spaces in our neighborhoods that often get filled with white coffee shops, but we can turn it into something else. So um, just bringing everything to our community, making sure the music looks like them, investing in our community of not just playing the music this one time, but have workshops with these children. And National Contemporary Ensemble um, used to do this at Abrams Art Center, where they had kids come in and make instruments and all these things. We can do the same thing for our people with more cultural instruments, more what is the ancestral place um, in education of doing graphic scores, right? you know, and all of these things. So definitely pushing ourselves to bring more to our community. We do go through a lot, but also a lot of black people do. 
Um, and we can just create this space for all of us to make more things together. The coffee shop and may also, the coffee shop may be white, but the coffee is black, right? <laughs> exactly. Period. So it's just remembering that like we also can't other ourselves and think it's oh my god. It's like the the memes on Twitter of like the black men in high school that or college are like yeah I like anime so black women don't like me mm -hmm. you know all this kind of shit and it's like no it's because you're anti-black <laughs> so um i feel like contemporary musicians it is easy to also kind of fall into that and just like why well, make this weird fucking music and i don't think my people would like it and it's like you can't say that you don't know that we love everything so I think also not othering ourselves is really important within our own community. We're going to wrap up here with Voices of the Ancestors. It's one of my favorite pieces, period. Oh, I mean, we're, we're not talking about one of my favorite pieces by you, one of my favorite pieces, period. Thank you. Um, but, but, but before we go there, um, how can folks, do, do you have a one-stop shop? How can folks um, support you, learn about what you're doing, and hear your music? Yes. Yeah, I mean, you can find everything on my Instagram um, at J-O-E underscore W-E-Y. And my link tree is there with my website, Bandcamp. Um, and on my website, you can find my YouTube and everything. Um, and please buy my album, not just stream it. But um, yeah, Voices of the Ancestors is really funny because I was completely improv. And it's actually one of the first um, big improvisations I've done in public. So um, New School was hosting, well, they were working with the 450 um, or the 400 year production at Riverside Church. And they, strangely enough, I wanted an improv um, improvisation, improvisation with bassoon. And I was like, okay. And my teacher sent to me and she was like, yeah, you should, this is you. So mm -hmm. um, I went and there was no rehearsal. It was just with these three drummers and they were amazing. Um, and in the, just the run through before, I was like, I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> I have never done that before. So I went to Patron, this amazing bar right by Manhattan School of Music, and got pretty fucking lit. Um, and came back, and that's just what happened. Like, <laughs> and it's one of those moments while you're improv um, improvising, you don't really know what is coming out. I could hear some themes. I was like, I'm going to bring this back. Okay, okay, we're winding down. Okay, let's shred. Okay, you know you can play this high E flat out your ass. So just like end on this high E flat and do an ante. So I kind of had the form, but then when I listened back that night, I was like, bitch, you did that, you know? So <laughs> <laughs> it was just so fun on how like, I was pretty lit. I was around all these black people. I was scared as fuck because Riverside Church is humongous. Mm -hmm. And I was like, so what's the turnout? They were like, oh, we have standing room. And I was like, okay, um, <laughs> let's do it. There's no other option. Uh, and I think just not putting pressure on myself, but knowing that I was surrounded by black people, um, who just want to hear music. They want to see this whole production. They want to see why am I a part of this and what can this instrument add to blackness and how can my ancestors come out? So um, that was just the most fun, one of the most memorable performances I've ever had in my life. Um, and yeah, I mean, even when I posted it, I didn't think it would get as much attention as it did. And it just showed me like, okay, it's good you believe in yourself, but also a lot of other people support you and support you support me taking this path that's not necessarily always an orchestra because I still play in orchestras. Mm -hmm. But um, that solo bassoon with contemporary techniques um, is valid and wanted. So, I get a lot of requests, Scott, for lists, ideas as far as black contemporary composers, black living composers. Joey gave it up. Mm -hmm. I mean, I thought about editing 
some things for time, but there is your information. You know, all of these people want to say, oh, well, where are the resources? These living composers like Joey are the resource. You just have to take the time to actually, as the title of that piece <laughs> suggests, shut the fuck up and listen. Uh, uh, so many people mentioned, so I hope uh, that you will go back, uh, if you haven't already, and list some of those names. One of the names that we brought up was Julius Eastman, and I've actually gotten a, a couple folks in my inbox uh, telling me, oh, have you heard of this or asking uh, me about it? Uh, do you have any experiences, uh, as, before we get into the triloquy, do you have any experiences with uh, the music of Julius Eastman or know much about it? When you put together your list of favorite recordings. And, uh, so was, was that the first that time? Was, that was the first time that I came across it. And uh, shout out John Fleischer a few weeks ago. He sent me a link to it. Like, have you guys talked about this on Triloquy yet? We have. We Is have. I yet? forget the yeah, opus yeah. number. I forget the opus number. But first uh, season. But uh, but but it's in there. Definitely first season. Uh, what I want to say about. Julius Eastman, you know, my experience back when I was at WUOT, somebody uh, sent me some information on Julius Eastman. I had heard his music before and knew his story. I never considered playing the music on the radio because the most infamous work uh, titled Evil-er, I guess I won't say it here because I'm a mixed company, but uh, it's long. It's, it's, it's something like 40 minutes. So for that reason alone, I never really considered it, but because folks were interested in that story. Uh, I, I excerpted it mm -hmm. for radio, mm -hmm. and and the feedback was phenomenal. And 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 this was years ago. You know, this was probably late 2016. So ever since then, um, I make sure that I say that name as much as I can. I guess we haven't really been saying it lately. Um, we'll 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 dig. There's not really a lot of time left in this opus. Uh, next time, uh, I'll, I'll write his name down. Next time, we'll we'll kind of get into the story of Julius Eastman, um, his involvement with the police. You know, the police owning his scores, the way he died on the streets, of just a, a testament to the problems in in America when it comes to race. Uh, definitely a name that you should know in Black history. So, um, again, shout out to uh, Joey and all the important work they're doing. Find a contemporary artist uh, to support. They're as much of a part as black history uh, as anyone else. Let's listen to a little bit of uh, that infamous piece by Julius Eastman to get us into the trilogy. <laughs> Scott, a lot of workers live Monday through Friday for the weekend. As far as my timeline was concerned, we need to get back to the weekday. <laughs> <laughs> oh. They didn't like the halftime show. Look, as I was sort of saying earlier in this opus, I don't pay attention to football because of Colin Kaepernick. Mm. I pay attention to the halftime shows because there have been some phenomenal performances. To hear Formation by Beyonce for the first time mm -hmm. was incredible. Mm -hmm. To see it rain down on Prince and the Marching 100 from FAMU. That's a big and, moment. Big and, moment. Prince, and Prince said, can it rain harder? Or whatever he he famously said. You know, just the moments that were the Katy Perry halftime when, when she brought out Missy and Lenny Kravitz. The way Lenny Kravitz sang, I kissed a girl, uh, I, I felt kissed the the lady uh that i mentioned lady gaga you know and everything so there have been some phenomenal halftime shows and we got there this have, one did you watch it uh i did what you think well i did start off to watch the whole game because i was really rooting for the chefs i, I really wanted the chefs to win and a, I f a football team named after chiefs <laughs> that's problematic in itself is it not go on never mind go on red <laughs> all right so I fell asleep, and when I woke up, the halftime show was going on. Mm -hmm. I did not recognize him. I thought he was trying to be Bruno Mars and not hitting the mark. Shade. <laughs> oh, and not hitting the mark? <laughs> T tell me I'm wrong. Okay, so for me, this is an opinion. And, uh, and, then, the next, and then I fell asleep again, and the next time it was like, you know, 30-something to 9. And so I just went downstairs and started playing guitar. 
See, I don't, I don't care about the, um, the football part of it all. I think it's very problematic that y'all are around here rooting for a white quarterback during Black History Month. I wasn't, but, but all of that. Is, I'm not here to talk about the football, the halftime show, weekend. The weekend didn't bring nobody out. What and and fine. Let let's let's ignore all of that as well. The problem that a lot of the musicians had, I'll get straight to it, is that he had the opportunity to showcase black violinists, black orchestral musicians, and did not. I got a lot of DMs from people saying, oh, don't you think that representation was so fun, da 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 blah, blah, blah. Uh, and I was only halfway looking. And I'm like, okay, wow, he has some violinists. I get straight to my Twitter and to my Facebook. All of my string player friends are cussing him out because he didn't actually, because they can tell by bow holds and all of that stuff well, that he didn't bother. The, some of them have the bow up here while right. others are down here. They weren't synced up. Right, right. There exactly. Wasn't, there wasn't a lot of, because, you know, Beyonce put that effort into every single component and we and, and we and we've had lady jess on the podcast to talk about mm -hmm. this the import the uh the importance of these celebrities centering every part of blackness including black folks who can actually play excuse me who can actually play these instruments yeah we've talked about beyonce's homecoming we've had um, Stephanie Matthews, early season two, talking about the contracting that she does out there in Hollywood, talking about her performing with Mary J. Blige, yeah. contracting the all-black woman orchestra for Lizzo at the last live Grammys. I think that was early uh, 2020. Um, and the and the weekend can't use all of that money he has to find some black musicians is very important, especially in the middle of this pandemic with so many musicians out here out of work. That gig would have been incredible for some black violinists to to get a little bit of coin. I don't I'm sure you saw it on my Instagram. Uh, I think last week we talked about the silhouette challenge. Yeah. Well, there are black violinists doing that so the 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 musicians are there and not only the black musicians who know the beethoven and brahms the black musicians who have their ear to the ground and are down with the culture who would have already known the weekend tracks that he wanted orchestrated you know we have to pay attention to these things because we aren't going to all get there until we all get there and i think celebrities have a responsibility to understand that you can highlight and give a platform to black musicians in these situations instead of hiring choreographers to hold stringed instruments. I think it's, I think it's pitiful. Shame on you the weekend. I hate to kind of crap on this one. I, I just don't know the artist and I don't know his music. So to me, there was no hook. I wasn't waiting on whatever hit was popular or whatever, you know, classic like Purple Rain or whatever. Sure. So who was that for? It wasn't for me. Uh, one of the other issues, you know, to that point, they say that a lot of these artists, all these artists have to actually pay to perform. There are millions of dollars. This is like advertisement for them and and their projects. I had no idea. I'm 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 not gonna shit on the weekend as far as his music. Uh, I I I knew all the songs he performed. I can't say that I didn't. So I I'm I have my ear to his catalog in that way. I just think it's a shame that there was no room given to any uh you know black women. He could have brought somebody out and plus the violinist thing that 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 bothered me mm -hmm. that 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 bothered me a lot yeah i feel bad saying anything one way or the other because i just don't know the guy's music well you so. should be able to advocate for black musicians who were not given a gig yeah. right over I, those choreographers i wonder if they just couldn't get lizzo or if she was otherwise booked for super bowl sunday look it it, it is what it is as far as the weekend getting the gig my takeaway, this is what I want people to understand, is that celebrities have a responsibility to highlight black instrumentalists when you have the opportunity to, and that opportunity was missed. I don't give a damn who's on stage. Pick your favorite country singer, your favorite root singer. I'm sure some of your favorite root songs have stringed backing. Oh, sure. They have a responsibility as well on platforms like that to hire string orchestras and not to hire string orchestra choreography. Who were all the guys in the, in the uh, bandages? Don't know. I don't know. I, t I, t I tell you, I do not know. Okay. <laughs> All I know is I know the songs. I don't understand what he was doing. Okay. Well, that's two of us. But then. what's your point about the folks of the folks of the bandages? Do you want clarification on that or what? 
<laughs> I want to know if they had plastic surgery too. Oh, the we can have plastic surgery. <laughs> I'm just- See, you know Diddy, because you you know more than I do. He, he was did. he was going around with bandages all over his face for a couple of weeks, wasn't he? I thought that was like press release or just sort of roll out for this album. See, this because, is why I shouldn't open my mouth, because I don't know any better. Okay, well, let's see if you can open your mouth about this. Final Triloquy. <laughs> I want to shout out uh, Danny Lutons off of tw- uh, Twitter. He uh, put this in my inbox. The headline here is, I'm reading from Complex.com. Black Capital Riot Participant Denied Bail despite others being released. All right, let me read. Criticism is stacking up in connection with 20-year-old Emmanuel Jackson, a participant in the violent Capitol riot earlier this month, who is now said to have been denied bail. Jackson, who is black, turned himself in to the Metropolitan Police Department in D.C. on January 18th and confirmed that he was seen in footage from the riot and per a New York Times report at the time confessed to participating in the violence. All right, Scott. Mm. Long story short. We got a black man tied in with all this stuff. And for everybody who's being denied bail and even outside of this insurrection, we got Riddleton. What's his name? Riddleton? Rittenhouse. Rittenhouse, who's who we don't even know where he at. But this black person who was seen in the crowd is denied bail. We know that there are two different justice systems. Right. Um, We also know that there was a woman who was allowed to go on her work retreat to Mexico after being arrested she hasn't yet had to go to court but the judge said sure you can go to mexico so do you think equity applies here and this is this is me why not not really having to clear either myself i mean free everybody is what i say but what do you you say about this because that insurrection was some serious business that folks need to pay for question one what was he doing there period Period. Because I saw like three black people in on that day. What were they doing there? Second question is, what is the dollar amount that the other people got out for? You know, how much did they pay to get out of jail? And why aren't there any, you know, why isn't Rick Schroeder and that other guy pulling together money to bail him out like they bailed out Rittenhouse? Why not? I think I said this uh, last week or maybe a couple weeks ago, and I'll say it again. Every black person, most black people grew with that parent saying you have to be two and three times better Mm -hmm. to get the same as them. The part B of that conversation is you can't do what they do. All right. To Mr. Jackson, I'm sorry. I am so sorry that you are in jail. The justice system has history of not doing us right. And now you're paying for that to the black person getting mixed up in any sort of white nonsense. Understand that you are going to pay the higher price. We have such a history of that. Black people have paid the higher price for, let's see, switching out things on the radio for doing all sorts of of things, you know, historically, and we see what happens. So my Advice to you, (laughs) if you are black and you are listening to this, center the fact that what we do comes at a higher cost. Even during Black History Month, Colin Kaepernick took a knee and look at everything that happened. And and football is is just as well. We still had a a Super Bowl in the middle of a pandemic. They had 20, uh, what, 22,000 people, 25, 25,000 people in the stadium. It is business as usual. They don't give one goddamn about Colin Kaepernick, they don't give a goddamn about Jackson, and they aren't gonna gonna give a goddamn about you if you find yourself mixed up into some shit, okay? They didn't care about, uh, 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 we talked about the inter- international double read discussions last week, had Joey on this week, you know, they didn't care about Joey's experiences as a black person, as a trans person, threw it away. We're seeing this over and over and over and over and over again, okay? And I feel like we're, we have to repeat ourselves because the lesson is not being learned. If Emmanuel Jackson had this lesson, maybe he wouldn't be in jail. Listen. Guard yourself. Watch yourself. They don't want us to exist in these spaces. They're going to find a reason to lock you up. They're going to find a reason to silence you. Don't get mixed up. Do the good work. Get into that good trouble that John Lewis said and stay away from the white activities that they are not going to have to pay for. See you next week. (laughs) 